first seminar of the Timothy A. Johnson Medical Scholar Seminar Series. This is a seminar series that was started several years ago, and it's named in honor of the first dean for research here at the School of Medicine. Dr. Tim Johnson actually um, did, laid a lot of the groundwork for the research domain as the medical students know it, with, the, with his real emphasis being making sure that every medical student had the opportunity to really engage deeply in meaningful research experience. Can you, can you use the microphone? No. <laughs> Which microphone? This one? All right. Okay. Now can you hear me? <laughs> All right. Thanks, Brad. Um, so I don't have too, too much more to say, but, but I think that today's speaker, we, we focus on inviting speakers who really embody this idea that Dr. Johnson championed, which is the idea that in order for good translational and clinical research to occur, we needed to bring together basic scientists and physicians. And so, as many of the first-year graduate medical students know, we, we ask you to sit in a room together and talk with each other, with the idea being that eventually you will learn how, what each other's strengths are and that that will really foster the type of research that's going to be transformative. And so our first speaker today you're going to hear a little bit more about from Dr. Miller, but I think really embodies the principles that this, this Medical Scholar Seminar Series was, was established to represent. So without further ado, I will in let Dr. T.K. Miller, the Vice Chair of Orthopedic Surgery here at uh, VTCSOM, introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Um, so it, it's really my uh, pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Stannard, who's from the University of Missouri Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Um, he received his undergraduate education at Brown University um, Medical School at the University of Virginia internship and residency at Brook Army Medical Center. This was then followed by an AO Trauma Fellowship in Switzerland. Dr. Sander holds his appointment as a, at the University of Missouri as professor in the Department of Orthopedics, where he's also the, I'll try to get this right, but there's an umlaut on it, so I'm not sure that I'll get it, okay? The, the Hans-Jörg Wiss Distinguished Chair in Orthopedic Surgery and is chairman of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. He's the medical director of the Missouri Orthopedic Institute, Associate Dean and Chief Medical Officer for Clinical Strategy Initiatives at MU Healthcare, and is also the President of AO North America. Uh, his clinical interests center on trauma and sports medicine, uh, which uh, we were discussing is an interesting overlap, and his passion, as will be presented today, extends the translation of biologic alternatives of joint preservation and salvage to clinical applications. Uh, I'm happy to welcome him back to the Star City, where he did get to spend a period of time during medical school, during his away rotations, which has changed a little bit, yes, fortunately. And we're quite privileged to have you here. Thank you very much for, for coming down to visit us. Thank you, DK. Well, it, it's, uh, it's nice to be back. Um, these are real quickly my disclosures, which I don't think any of them have anything really to do with this talk. But uh, as he said, I, I have, I have a, a background from uh, your, your friends up the road, but I also have a little bit of a background here as well in that I did rotations here as a third year student. And my, my wife reminded me of, of, of her coming down and, and spending time with me uh, when I had a call weekend uh, when we were sleeping together on the single twin bed because we were too cheap to, to buy a hotel room. And she's also pregnant with our first and I don't think we got much sleep, but anyway. So it, it was nice to, to see uh, the place where I did one of my two rotations. I also did one at the Salem VA. I also have a little bit of a tie that, uh, that this guy coached this guy, who's my fourth child. Uh, and, and so I, I had, a, had a pretty good tie with, with uh, Coach Fuente. So uh, lot, lots of ties to this area. And my vice chairman is a, 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 at Missouri is an engineer master's degree holder from Virginia Tech, too. So. I don't have the appropriate Virginia versus Virginia Tech hate. I actually like them both. Um, in terms of today's presentation, and, and I can see right now our, our, it's coming up in the wrong order, but I'm going to put them up. First, we're going to look at the problem. And then second, what, how do we go after that in terms of basic science? And then look at the mechanisms by which it can fail. And one is cell viability. Next one's bony incorporation. Then meniscus healing. Then we'll look at some technique changes that I think have added to the mix a little bit. And then clinical outcomes. And I'm going to present here for the first time 
our, our results in a, a series of 194 patients with up to four-year follow-up that we've just gotten. And then what's next, maybe, and, and hopefully there'll be time for all that. Uh, I'm gonna blow through some of this quickly because there's a, an awful lot as I tried to figure out how much time we have and how much to synthesize for you, but post-traumatic osteoarthritis, why, why is it critical? It's a huge cause of disability in the world and in the United States, more than $100 billion per year cost. There isn't any direct cure. And actually, my partner in crime in this is named Jimmy Cook, and he's a veterinary orthopedic surgeon as well as PhD, and so he notes it hits all species and, and really is a, an issue of quality of life. And the AO is an orthopedic trauma kind of research education consortium. They came up with the idea of fixing fractures and getting people out of casts, and they would say motion is life and life is motion. Uh, and I think that's very true when it comes to our joints as well, and if you start to lose that, it really changes your quality of life. So articular cartilage is this fascinating substance in the human body that allows a joint to move painlessly uh, as long as that cartilage is in good shape and, and do well. But when it gets damaged, we've really always struggled with how can we, how can we bring it back to good function? And the natural uh, way that the body tries to heal is with fibrocartilage, whereas hyaline cartilage is what you had that you lost. And uh, the problem with that is, while it's better than raw bone being exposed, if you've broken through your hyaline cartilage, it, it, it doesn't have the same properties, and it begins to deteriorate as you use it heavily within 24 to 36 months. And so short-term failures occur pretty rapidly if you do this, which is microfracture, trying to let the body just bring in cells and repair it. You're getting the fibrocartilage, and it's not holding up, and then they start to fail. And that treatment does also burn some bridges potentially for some other things you could do in the future uh, by doing that process of microfracture. There are different goops and scaffolds and things we've tried to come up with to maybe figure out ways to, to make the body heal it better, but they all still end up making a fibrocartilage, maybe a little bit better, more cellular fibrocartilage, but still make a fibrocartilage. Well, what else can we do? And I, I'm really compressing and going very quickly into, in this part, but the other thing we can do is joint replacement. There's a miraculous development. Sir John Charnley originally started pushing it and caught a lot of heat when he came up with it, just like we catch some for what we're doing now. But this looks from the British National Health Service, which is a great way to look because everybody's got the same insurance in Britain. So they don't lose people by having them move from doctor to doctor, because even if you change doctors, it's the same health insurance, so they know how you did. And this looked at lifetime risk of getting a revision total joint. And what they found was in males age 50 to 60, it was between 35 and 38 percent. This post in 2017 in The Lancet. And for females, it was at 20 percent from 50 to 54 years old and dropped down a little bit to about 16 percent, 55 to 59. And even a little bit more than you'd like to see up, up through the 65-year-old. And then it drops way off. Originally, they were developed for people that were sedentary, elderly, and, and then people have moved them to more and more indications because people are damaging their cartilage and having significant problems with pain. So this leaves our typical patient caught between a rock and a hard place. They can do something like that that doesn't hold up very well and doesn't relieve their pain for very long, or they can do the total joint, but that's heading them down a pathway where they may indeed be looking at revisions or multiple revisions during their lifetime. And the, the results of revision total joints are often far inferior to the, the initial primary one. And so, and, and it's not something that allows you to have the same level of activity. So it, it's a dilemma. What do you do for this patient, this younger or uh, young at heart? So very active, I'm 59, but I work out most days for 45 minutes to an hour and I really care about that. And so uh, I think either young or young at heart or both a group that we have a dilemma right now. What do you do? What do we define as success? We're searching for hyaline cartilage, not fibrocartilage. So this is what we're after and what we believe is the way to go. And a problem with it is you've got to get that cartilage to integrate with the bone and form a tide mark where it integrates that allows it to really function like cartilage. And that's where researchers have struggled trying to get cartilage repair products they often, it doesn't form that tide mark and it goes down that fibrocartilage line instead. And you can talk all kinds of things of what do, you, what do you measure, what kind of function do you want to check. I will tell you what patients consider success and that's pain relief. They want pain relief, it's pure and simple. They want to be able to be active and they want pain relief. So, what are the options out there? There's lots of different cellular products, but 
at least in our mind, none of them have hit what we'd like to. They're all various uh, fibrocartilage-like final results, we think. Now, not everybody totally agrees with that, but some people think some of those are better than I do. Um, the best current option we're aware of is osteochondral allograft transplants. So you can take a pretty damaged area and replace it with this beautiful looking area and end up with something that looks like that once it's replaced and in there. Uh, and when it works, it works pretty well. 88% return to sport, 79% at the pre-injury level. And so, so that's, that's pretty good. Um, 10 and 15 year survivorship is okay. So 71 to 85% or 74%, that means 25, 26% failed. But it's pretty long term, so is it a failure if you got 10 years more of, of activity level and pain relief? Don't know, but that's what the numbers look like. So this has become a focus for us at the University of Missouri. Now we'll tell you when you get into bigger areas, so this is a, uh, a bipolar graft, so a graft on both sides of the joint and, and a, men a meniscus to boot. And this is one where the meniscus exploded and look what happened. It just totally destroyed that articular cartilage. The failure rate in the literature for these bipolar graphs has been 30 to 60 percent in most studies, and one study as high as 86 percent. So most people stop doing them. And that's where things are a little bit controversial, as we have now gone back toward doing much, much more severely injured patients, uh, and, and that's a little bit controversial potentially. So what are the problems? Again, it's chondrocyte viability. It's getting the graft to incorporate into the patient, and then transplantation techniques and post-op management. Those are, those are the things that make or break this. What was the science behind it? What made us start this? Well, my, my science colleagues came through with an idea that we needed a different way to preserve these grafts because the tissue banks told us we could do it up to 28 days after the death of the donor with the ways they had to preserve it. Well, that's great, but the government said you're going to have to do bacterial testing and make sure they're, they're not in any way contaminated by bacteria. That's 14 days. Then the medical examiner has to sign off on it, and then if they do sign off on, a, on day 14, they've got to ship it to you. So you just use 15 days. So now you're down to 13 days potential time to implant it. But I said, I looked at their studies, and they have a lot of cells dying in day 22 to 28. I'm drawing my line at 21 days, which now we're down to six days of implantation time. Uh, what's the result of that? Up to 80% of the grafts have ended up being thrown away and never implanted because they couldn't get a match, since the size has to be exact, by the time that the graft expired. That led to those that did get implanted having to pay for all of them, which meant these grafts are incredibly expensive which is another problem with the cost of our healthcare system. So all of these were problems we felt like we had to deal with. So let's look at how these can fail and how we addressed it scientifically and, and, uh, and hopefully then clinically. So the first way they can fail and the thing that I think is the most important is the chondrocytes, the cells, have to be alive and viable. So this is where our lab developed a new way to preserve them. And I'll show you that and then go back to this. That's the, the fluid that you soak it in and lots of studies and grants behind it is what was developed. And then we, we looked at this and we did, did a, a dog study and, and what this shows you is just a quick summary that in every one of the dogs that was unsuccessful and you can look at that is now looking like fibrocartilage, the joint's angry, look at how red that is, that doesn't look good and that looks gorgeous. The joint's happy, you can barely tell the outline of that graft versus the rest of the cartilage because that one has incorporated successfully. You look at the histology and you've got no cartilage in there, it's all just fibrous, versus beautiful cartilage in there. And then get used to these red-green stains. If it's green, that's live chondrocytes, and if it's red, it's dead. So that's the difference. And in, in this particular dog study, every single unsuccessful one had cell viability going in of between 23 and 62 percent. And every single one that worked had 70 to 99 percent. So there seemed to be, at least in this dog model, a 100% correlation. If you're over 70, you're good, and if you're under 62, you're bad, and I don't know what happens if you're between, because we didn't have any that were between in this study. And again, that was using this, this unique system. Why is it called MOPS, Missouri Osteochondral Preservation System? 
Uh, and so they, they had done, and again, other people did all of the work on developing that. And it's a couple things that are different with it. It's both the nutrients that are in, in this fluid, but it's also that it's done at room temperature. Whereas all of the other tissue bank protocols, they put it in a refrigerator. And cartilage does not like being cold. It's, it's like me. It likes, it likes warm. Uh, so so that's, that's the system. Now, one thing I did propose, there was argument when I, when I was first getting to work with them, do you even need live cells? Or is it just a scaffolding and then the recipient cells are going to essentially go and, 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 and take over that graft? And that was being argued at the time. And I said, well, you know, we ought to do a study and we ought to use male donors, female recipients, and then see whose cells survive. And this was the same study that also gave those percentages of, of, uh, of, of viability and how it correlated. And again, that's dead and that's alive. And you're trying to look at, does it matter? And this shows, again, what happens over time with the preservation systems. And this is with the normal system, 70% being your, your drop-off, and that's right around that day 28 point. But you can see, see how precipitously it's falling in that last, that last week? And then look at what happens after day 28. It really falls off quickly. So um, when we looked at this, this is where we came into this study, where it, it correlated very directly with how many cells were alive. But even more interestingly, we looked at, OK, but of the, uh, in this graft and in this graft, whose cells are making it up? And this is where it's a hard stain to get to work. And we only got about 50% of them to work. But this stain stains based on the sex of the cell. Uh, and this is an unsuccessful one on this side, just like that says. And this is the line between the graft and the patient. And chondrocytes are circular. They're pretty sparse. So here you can see this is female chondrocytes. They're blue. They're fairly sparse, and they're round. This is the failed graft. And what you can see is it's mostly longer spindle-shaped cells and they're blue, they're female. So in the failed graft, the female cells had come into the graft to try and repair it with fibrocartilage. It's fibrous tissue. It's not nice, round chondrocytes. Now over here, you got the same thing, but it was a successful one. So you got your nice, blue, round, circular cells, but the male cells stained pink. And so here you've got, this is the graft, and the surviving cells in the successful graft are male not female. So in the unsuccessful one, you've got fibrous cells that are female. The successful one, you've got the donor male cells. So that suggested that, indeed, you do need live chondrocytes in order to have this work, and that those viable chondrocytes are what are responsible for maintaining that donor articular cartilage health for the long term. So the ability of this new way of preserving to potentially take the graft out much further in time, we hoped and what we thought it was going to do was make it to where we could have a much longer window of opportunity to implant the cells. And it does do that. It, it, we drew the line at day 56 because there were zero failures of under that 70% threshold by day 56. We've seen some go out past 90 days where they're above that, but some are failing too, and we wanted no failures. So it definitely took the opportunity for implantation way out, and, and that's a definite game changer. So then what do we do after we do this basic science look where it looks like it's doing that? Well, we go into the animal. And we've done the animal research side, but now how about Dr. Cook's patients? So Buddy came along. And Buddy is a male pointer. He's a field trial champion, if any of you have done any, any sort of uh, dog show type things. These are athletes. And Buddy tore his ACL. And when a dog tears their ACL, they have, a, they have a posterior slope to their tibia of about 21, 22 degrees. And so if you don't do something about that ACL quickly, they become really badly arthritic. And Buddy had had four different surgeries. All of them had failed. Uh, lost his medial and lateral meniscus. Hydro, uh, uh, hyaluronic acid and steroid injections. Rehab. He was down to his last hope. His owner brought him because he'd heard about what Dr. Cook had been doing. And he was going to put Buddy down if it didn't work. And I'll show you why in a second. Buddy's not only smarter but better looking than most of my patients. So this is Buddy, and what you can see is Buddy, his ribs are showing through. He won't put any weight on that left hind leg. Um, and he, he's not eating, he's not happy, and that's why he was going to potentially put him down. Here was Buddy at surgery. Now, I, I recognize a lot of you here aren't orthopedic surgeons, but the orthopedic surgeons in the room are all looking at it and saying, where's the knee? This is, <laughs> this is his knee. 
That's a femoral condyle. There's nothing else you can recognize. That's his tibial plateau. That's his other femoral condyle. This is awful. Uh, it's amazing that Buddy could put, do anything. That was what was done at surgery. So now we've got tibial plateau, meniscus, meniscus, femoral condyle, and then the only native thing that was kept. And then here's Buddy. Remember about that left leg. Here's Buddy six months post-op. We decided we'd name that the standard test. Um, then here's Buddy three years post-op. And Buddy returned to field trials and, and did, did quite well. So got it to work in the dog model and in the dog patient. But dogs are a lot more resilient than humans. So what do you do with this? It's a 26-year-old. Played college volleyball. Well, a lot of people do, and their knees don't look like this. That's all bone. There's no cartilage. There's no cartilage. There's no cartilage in here. It was like, my gosh, how did she do this? So then we went to human validation studies. We'd done with the canine tissue. Now we needed human tissue. Does it behave the same way when we try to preserve it? And here you can see with this, this SOC is standard of care. So this is what, to this day, every other tissue bank does. Here's 28 days. Remember what I told you that red is dead. So what you can see is there's a lot. Here's day zero control. Look at all that green. Now you can see there's a lot of red in here. And look at the surface. It's all red. So I look at the surface of the outer coating that's like armor. And you start to pierce that, and now you've got the soft underbelly exposed. Look at the MOPS graphs at day 28. How about at day 56 compared to day 28 there? How about day 70 compared to day 28 there? And we start to see, man, there is this enormous difference. Forget that we can preserve it longer. Take a look at the quality even of the day 56 graph compared to the day 28. Then I looked, when we first started our center, we put in more of the non-MOPS graphs than the MOPS graphs because we just didn't have enough. And I drew my line at 21 days. So I really thought they'd be great graphs. But we sent them to the lab with any leftover tissue to check tissue viability. Wouldn't help that patient because it's already in that patient. But for decision making in the future and for academic reasons, we did that. This was in October, the first year we had the center going, a patient that I did. Both of these two I'm going to show you are in October. This is a day 21, and we got this back, and I felt sick to my stomach. Look at all that dead cartilage, and look at how many other dead cells. And I don't know about your eye, but my eye says that I'm not seeing 70% green there. And so I'm very concerned. Now, this was the same week. That was a day 54 MOPS graft. And I looked at those two, and I said, uh, that is way too much difference for me to feel comfortable. And so we ended up doing a study where we looked at a whole bunch of specimens of both. And what we found was the standard of care ones averaged 62% viability, which isn't much different than their white paper said, because they said at 28 days, average of 70% viability. We averaged 98%. So we not only got way more time and the convenience for the patient and for us and for getting insurance approval and all those things, but we got an incredible unanticipated difference in the quality of these graphs. And, and that's the part that at the end is really exciting. So when we then did with the human tissue a study of, of viable chondrocyte density and we correlated it back to surgical cases, we found that successful ones averaged at least 83% viable chondrocytes. A revision means that they had another fresh osteochondral allograft done. They averaged 20.4%. So they failed and had to have it redone. And these ones went on to total joint. That's what a failure is in the literature, the way the nomenclature is done. I consider both of these failures, but that's how they do the literature nomenclature. And they averaged 32.3%. So what you can see is here's normal. Here's our successful ones. They're better than that cutoff. And then here's the revisions and fares. So it appears to make a big difference. Now, right at the same time as I was presenting this at the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, immediately following me was a guy named Jack Farr, who's a really well-known cartilage researcher from Indianapolis. And Jack was presenting on these decellularized graphs that were purposely decellularized because the theory was your own cells are going to go repopulate them. I had no idea he was presenting it. It wasn't published yet. And I had no idea what Jack was going to say. Was he going to follow me, and he's a really well-known guy, and say, BS, watch how these worked. He followed me and said, essentially, we had a 100% failure, 72% within two years. But as time went on, it was 100% failure of these decellularized graphs. It doesn't work. So the two papers actually totally uh, fit together in saying the same thing. This is that head-to-head -head study looking at 50 of our graphs, 26 from other tissue banks. And what you see is 
Viable chondrocyte density of 96.7% for us, and all were greater than 70. Viable chondrocyte density of 48.4 for theirs, with uh, only 19% in this study greater than 70%. So that means all the other patients, that graft was dead on arrival, and it was just a matter of time. In many cases, we've had a few that are below 70 and they worked and don't know why, but they did. So it, it's not like you, it's an automatic death sentence, but it's, it's up pretty strong toward, toward it's not going to work well. So basically, we had two key factors here, and that was that they were stored in the warmer temperature. And to this day, all the others put them in refrigeration. And they, you may say, why are they put them in the refrigerator? You guys don't even have to spend the money for fridges, which is true. And the concern was uh, bacterial contamination, that in a warmer environment, it might be easier for the grafts to become contaminated. But as we did the study, and we had to do this part for the FDA, we did not have any higher infection rate of our grafts than the ones in the refrigerator. But that's why, historically, they went. And what we did find in a separate study is that when you change from either refrigeration or from 25, from room temperature to 37, that alone harms the chondrocytes. They don't like that rapid change in temperature. So if we stored them at 37, they'd probably do even better, but nobody's doing that right now, and, and that might become a problem, I don't know, for, from a, a, a contamination part. So the game changer here is both the nutrients for that fluid and the temperature, but it, it makes a big difference in chondrocyte viability, and I think this issue is more or less solved. Okay, what's the second way they can fail? Bony integration. So we're implanting bone and cartilage together, and we want the, the patient's, the recipient's bone to heal to the graft bone, and the recipient's cells to take over the graft bone while the donor cartilage cells live on. So this is a patient of mine came back to the clinic. I looked at this x-ray and said, oh, I don't like what I'm seeing. And I don't know if you all can see it, but right there and right there, I'm seeing a line and a look like this graft is not looking like good solid bone and looking like it's not incorporating. You get the feel that the surface is intact, but this is not doing well. And I said, I think we've got a problem. So I took him to the OR the next day and scoped it. That's what it looked like. The cartilage did indeed look fine, but it was totally not healing in here. So I actually grafted behind that and salvaged this and got it to work. But what we need to have happen is we need the bone, which is devoid of cells, so that you don't get an immune response. You're purposely washing those cells out. We need that to heal to the recipient's bone by a process called creeping substitution. And, we, and it's very aptly named. We need those cells to creep in and take over that graft, and it's a slow process that can run out of gas very easily. Now, I proposed as we were seeing, man, this is our biggest problem is getting that bone to heal. And, and I, meanwhile, had started using bone marrow aspirate concentrate in some tough fracture situations and gotten some good results. As so I said, what do you suppose would happen if we soaked these grafts in BMAC? And so there's what it looks like. You draw 120, c's, c, 120 cc's of bone marrow, and you end up with about five cc's of what we want, which is the concentrate of cells. So it's grabbing all kinds of cells from that bone marrow, and we're taking that and we're soaking the graft with it. So that's my fingers holding one of these grafts, and we're soaking it with this bone marrow aspirate concentrate. And it's seeding cells in there. And so we, of course, did that great scientific method. I said, I wonder if that'll work, and so we did it, right? Didn't go to lab first, didn't just said, we've used it in humans, and it was something that's approved for human use. So I said, let's just do it. So we had a guy who was a really good baseball player, signed a scholarship with Mizzou, and then had foolishly played uh, high school football his senior year after he had the scholarship, and, and really trashed his knee with a lateral corner injury, but also got the cartilage and bone. And this is what his six-week post-op x-rays looked like. Now, normally, I could pick out the outline of the graft for about six months. I looked at this, and I was like, I can't see the graft. Now, I know where it is because I know where those screws are relative to the graft. And I can tell you that it's right here. But I was like, it's six weeks out, and, and that thing looks like it's all one. So then we went to the lab and said, okay, we got to see if this, there's something real to this. So we did a study where we basically took bone marrow aspirate concentrate, PRP, and saline, and said, let's see superficially and then deep down near the cartilage if we get any cells. And the bright green circles are the, are the cells, most of them pluripotential already going down the bone line, a few stem cells. And, uh, and what you see is only in the BMAC one, many more on the surface. Well, that makes sense. We're dripping it on the surface. A few down deep, nothing in any of the others. And so what it showed was, indeed, superficial, you get more. 
deep, you get some. And when we looked at colony forming units of these cells, the BMAC had a bunch, PRP had just a couple, because you get a couple cells, and saline had nothing. And that allows, again, for this process. Now, this is an MRI scan. And when I first saw this, I was like, what on earth is that? So I'm putting the x-ray up so that you can see it. And what you can see here is that the bone is, is right against the bone here. But when you get an MRI of that, it looks like there's this huge black thing right here. And what is that? Well, that's creeping substitution. That's an MRI picture of that process. Or when you look here, when you first look, you'd say, oh, that's a non-union. Well, no, it's not. It's creeping substitution. That black line is the cellular process moving into that graft, which started out way out here. And it's basically taking over this graft. So it's an MRI picture of creeping substitution. And then we finally did a study where we applied it to some patients, didn't have it applied to others, and then looked at bony incorporation with a radiologist who was blinded to which group they were in. And what we found was a statistically significantly increased amount of integration in, at all three time zones if they had the bone marrow aspirate concentrate. So that looked like a game changer. Third way it can fail is if the meniscus doesn't work. And this is an example. This was a patient I had after doing one of these graphs back when we used all this ugly hardware. I'll show you what we do now in a minute. And, and this looked pretty good. It was early, though. It's only two months out, having zero pain. Warned, don't do anything that's impact or too much activity. She was so excited to have zero pain, though, and she didn't listen very well to that part and thought, I'm having no pain. I must be healing faster than he thought. And so she went and started a, 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 a good uh, workout program with lots of lunges. That didn't work so well. Remember that exploded meniscus I showed you? That was hers. And you can see, you look at that, and you're like, oh, okay, that's not good. And what we found was if the meniscus fails, it's going to be ugly. And so when you looked at the graphs we got, we got what still most of the tissue banks give you when you get a graft, which is it's like a gigantic bucket handled tear. You've got the meniscus, and it's hooked to the bone here and here, and it's totally free here. You could swing that just like a pail, uh, a, a handle to a bucket. That's what they would give. Well, we did a separate study with uh, a friend of TK's, Pat Smith and I did this together with Jimmy Cook, because Pat actually was the one who thought up, he said, I think the meniscotibial ligament's a really important structure that's underappreciated. So we studied it, and sure enough, it was very important for stability of the ligament. So then we said, well, we, we can't leave them like that, so let's reconstruct the meniscotibial ligament. So we would do these little push lock screws and do that. And then we said, you know, that's really stupid, because what nature or God gives us is way more robust so we just got the tissue bank to quit debriding that out. And that solved it. If they would just save a little labor, don't cut that structure out, and now you've got a great meniscotibial ligament. So I think that really has solved, to a large extent, the meniscus problem. Live, fresh meniscus combined with the native meniscotibial ligament. So what else have we done that's different that's allowing us to push this envelope? Well, some technique differences. So most people, when they do this, what they're talking about when they do a fresh graft is a circle like this. And as long as the damage is confined to that circle, I'll do the same thing. It's a great way to do it. It's a press fit. You don't need any sort of hardware of any type, and, and, and it, it tends to heal and work really well. However, if you have a bigger area, what people have done is the snowman technique. So here you can see, just like the kid snowman, you've got the base and the body and then the head, and each of these graphs is dependent upon the other one for their stability. Even stupider, I've got a circle here, and then I just cut out part of that to fit the next one in, making the curvatures not match quite right. And then I cut out a little bit to this one, and I cut out part of that one. And I was just like, that's, that's just stupid. That's a dumb way to do this big area. So we said, ban the snowman. What we do instead is we cut out the entire area that's bad, and we put in an entire new area that's perfect curve and perfect match. It's a little bigger area, clearly, but it's a, it's a perfect match. Because we know from the tumor literature that when you do these big grafts, they almost uniformly fail. You have to do a thin graft that, that can work. So we went to our scientists and we said, OK, we know big grafts fail. How, how thick can we get? Because a thicker graft is going to be stronger for walking on. However, it's going to be much harder to get that cellular incorporation. So they said, okay, well, let us look. So first they looked at biomechanics, and they looked at 3, 6, 9, and 12 millimeter graphs. And sure enough, what you would expect, the 3 millimeter graphs are thin enough that they started to break and show high stress. 6 is getting pretty good. 9 is great. 12 is, is really great. 
But now let's look at the biology and getting the creeping substitution. And there, a three millimeter graft is awesome, because red's good in this case. Uh, six millimeter is okay. We're getting some nutrition in there. Nine's a problem, because we got zero going up here, and 12's a real big problem. So when you put the two up opposite each other, your perfect area is six to seven millimeters thick. So we cut these grafts six to seven millimeters thick to this day, and that will allow for that creeping substitution to occur. So here's what it looks like. We also, we want stability, so we cut a geometric keel equivalent here. So you're going to have this three-dimensional fit. So the graft looks like that. Now, there's no, there's no guide. That's my fingers holding it to give you a size perspective. You can see that's only seven millimeters. And it takes a little while to cut it because it's all being cut by hand. We need eventually to get, get some guides. That's what our tibial plateau looks like. Again, my finger's holding it. So you can see you've got about two, three millimeters of cartilage. The rest is bone, but it's not that thick of bone. That's the part that's got to get the creeping substitution, though. So what else has changed? We've changed that we don't do snowman. We've got this thin, thin size that's just right. Well, remember that ugly hardware I showed you? Well, sometimes the screws back out, and we didn't like that. So we came out, and we found a new product, and we did go to the lab first before we did this, and we found that there was a product that, would, that was bioabsorbable, in theory anyway, uh, but that could gain you some compression but was much less likely to come back out. And so the first patient we were going to try it on was this young lady who was actually a New York model who had a significant area of damage and pain. And I said to her, do you have any idea what this incision looks like as you're a model? And she said, I don't care. That's what Photoshop's for. Fix my knee. <laughs> and, and so we did. And she was the very first one that we did this on. And that's what we put in. And this is what she looks like. So you remember those? And can you pick out the graft? Barely. If you look carefully, this is only three months out right there. And on this lateral, I'm really having trouble finding it. Um, and, and she's done, she's over two years out now, done phenomenal. Actually, said, forget, forget this modeling stuff. I'm going back to what I really like. She's a college volleyball coach now, which is how she'd injure herself to start with. Um, but uh, so this is the clinical outcomes I told you that we would, I, I would tell you about. And this is one to four year follow-up, 194 patients. And, and so this is, I think, the biggest single study that I'm aware of anyway. You always hate to say this is the biggest or first or best because then somebody will find something that's bigger. But I'm not aware of a single study that's bigger than this. So there's some, some ones that have pooled, pooled studies that are bigger, but, but not a single one that I'm aware of. Our mean is 30 months of follow-up, up to, up to uh, four years. And the mean age is 37.9, BMI 28.9. And then the graphs, 38% are unipolar. Now remember, I told you that a bipolar graft had 30 to 60% failure rate. Almost two-thirds of our graphs are bipolars. And then even of the ones that are, uh, that, that are not bipolar, there's a number of them that are multiple surfaces. Uh, this is an example of a patella and a trochlea, for example. How are they doing? Well, the initial success rates are 79% for all cases combined, but that's only 60% on those standard of care preservation graphs versus 84% for the MOPS graphs. The MOPS graphs were significantly more likely to have a successful outcome compared to the standard uh, preservation protocol. And then th we do a lot of patient-reported outcome scores, and they were significantly different. I'll show the graphs in a second for both pain and function at all cohorts through three to four years. When you take a look at major reoperations, what you find is we've had 19 patients, or 10%, that have had a revision. Remember, that means you went and did it again. Here's the ugly pre, the, the new bioabsorbable. But that's when we did just screws. 26 or 13% have had failures. That means they went on to total joint. So again, I consider all of those failures, but, but that's how the literature calls it. Our bipolars are significantly higher, just like in the regular literature, but our MOPS graphs are significantly lower with only 5% and 11% respectively compared to 21 and 19. So it's a huge difference that's being made. Um, our, our 21 and 19 is, is fairly good considering the type of cases we're doing compared to the literature but it's really good when we start using the MOPS graphs. Here's the pain scores. So we started with the pain scores that averaged in the five to six range. Our four-year patients are down below one, and they, much to my surprise, they have kept getting better at each step. If we look at the patient-reported outcomes, and these are a whole bunch of different scores. The IKDC is the International Knee Documentation Committee, the SANE score, and the PROMISE score. And the red is your pre-op, and then that's one, two, three, and four years. And what you'll see is literally at each stop, they keep getting better. 
Now, at some point, they're going to top out. But what it's telling us is that the function is, has been impaired for so many years that they're not getting as good as they're going to get after one or even two years. They're going all the way out to four years. And this is really busy, um, but it's just the revision and failure rates are the main things. These are why, why we believe they failed. And there is a little bit of a difference as to why all of the MOPS ones are either meniscal tear and extrusion or allograft bone necrosis. It's one of those two in all cases. But you can see 21 and 19 versus 5 and 11. Uh, and then the overall group is 12 and 13 when you combine them. kaplan meyer survival probability. Take a look at the MOPS graphs. 98.5 at 6 months. Drops a lot, so almost all the failures occur between 6 and 12 months. Down to 92, but then 89, 89, and 89. And that's what other studies have shown. When you get past that first year, they tend to stabilize out and hold pretty well, and you usually only lose a very few graphs, few and far between. So, so that's kind of the science behind this. Now I want to introduce you to some patients. So we got six patients here, all of whom have agreed to have a share. Now, remember Buddy? Well, this was one of my patients. And I will tell you that the biologic total joints are hard to get to work, and this guy needed a biologic total. He had hemophilia. All of his joints were completely normal except for one knee. He had to convince me, and I've, once I learned how much the factor replacement cost, I'm not doing a whole lot more hemophiliacs. Um, but he felt strong he had a right to care, and, and uh, every other joint was normal. And he also convinced me that this happened when he was a teenager and wasn't keeping up with his factors and was being rather foolish. And he was otherwise in perfect physical, physical condition other than that. And so we did it. This is what we cut out. Oops. Oh, yeah. And I'll show you how it came out in a minute. I'm going to show you all of them, the, the pathology first, and then I'll show you what, what happened. This is a Polish tourist, 26-year-old, uh, a guy named Joe Shen. So she was involved. She was over hiking in the Philippines, got in a motorbike accident, and got this fracture. And I don't know if they did lousy work or if there was missing bone and cartilage. But this is what she looked like. This is a guy named Joseph Schatzker. All the, all the orthopedic surgeons in, in the room know who that is. The Schatzker classification is the classification we do for tibial plateaus. He's an incredibly bright guy. He's Polish in background, but, but, but he, his family was Jewish, and they fled the Nazis in World War II. He has a fascinating story of that. Uh, and they settled in Canada. Well, Joe was back speaking in Poland, and the doctors brought, that's Kasia, that's the patient, they brought her actually and said, we have no idea what to do with this. And he'd been at meetings where I'd spoken about this stuff. And he said, you need to take her to the University of Missouri. And, and Joe was a real skeptic, but he really believed. He'd been in Toronto where they'd started all this and had not been impressed with their results. But he'd watched us take this science one step at a time. And so this is when Cassia came and she had to walk. She had a real bad valgus knee because of the, the hole. And as long as she walked with crutches, she did OK. But if she got rid of the crutches, both pain and instability became a problem. So they took out the hardware for us ahead of time to get it ready. And then she was waiting to hear if a graft cleared to hop on a plane in Warsaw, Poland, and come to us. And this is what it looked like when we got her. My concern was the damage had been all here, but this had been walking on that. So I was worried, is her femur going to be OK also? Um, this is the next one, a 19-year-old truly elite di diver. She was on the Missouri Swim and Dive team, Olympic caliber. She had the classic, it was just one lesion, but a pretty big one. Occurred the day before the national championships, her freshman year. She dove and she got too close and hit the board and hyperextended. And you know, you always want they get really close. You're always, man, do they ever? Well, yeah, they do ever. She actually took second in the nation diving on that the next day. Um, but, but then she quickly, her knee started going downhill badly. This is that baseball player that I told you about, the bone marrow aspirate concentrate. And he got his lateral corner and then this big osteochondral fracture right in there. Really elite baseball player, not that good in football, but he foolishly played football his senior year. An Army officer, bleeds green. Now, so this was, this was after my own heart. My dad was career, and I was in for 10 years. And this guy cared so badly about staying in the Army. But he was about to get uh, boarded out of the military. He needed bilateral meniscus transplants, cartilage, ACL, and a PLC, posterior lateral corner. And he was not deployable and facing a medical retirement. And this one's a real favorite of mine. I'll show you some commercials we have here in a minute. And she's, she's in one of these. So this is her first operation at age 10. She was a level 10 gymnast. So I'm told it goes to 11, that 11 is essentially Olympic uh, level. And she, she had been level 10, but then she started having uh, uh, patella dislocations and got cartilage on her patella. And she tried to keep going. You can see uh, here she is going. And now you can see she's trying to make it work, but it's not working out too well. 
So, how did they do? Well, first let's go to our hemophiliac. That's what came out. That's what went in. This is him at his one or two year follow up. He's now just come to four years. Still going strong. Now, of course, this is the first biologic total that I tried. Worked like a charm, right? And a hemophiliac of all things. You see his, his little grin there at the end. Um, however, this is the one group we've had trouble with. And why did, why did the problem things always work the first time and then not so well after? But, but this is the one I don't think we've totally solved yet, is the biologic totals. Uh, the 27 months, he's now added another year to that, so he's more like 39 months now. Um, this is our Polish tourist. This is the tibial plateau, what we do. Somebody asked, how do you put in the tibial plateau? You cut the entire thing out. And I always do this part under fluoro because the artery is hanging right here. Uh, and take it out under fluoro. This is what we removed. Unfortunately, she did get the femoral condyle as well, so we also put in that. This is what it looked like arthroscopically right afterwards. So you see this beautiful cartilage, beautiful meniscus, beautiful cartilage. That's what she looked like five and a half months post-op. So you can see the two graphs. They, they're much more dense bone because she'd been on crutches for a couple of years on everything else. And you can see this is back in the screws days. And uh, so that's what she looked like. She was walking a kilometer uh, at about six months. Remember, she'd been on crutches for two years. This was her. She sent us this video at about two years out. She sent a Christmas card more recently where she was running up and down the steps of a big museum. And she is now three years and... Now, three years and five months out, and doing really well. And she also got engaged while she was in Colombia uh, to a Polish guy who came with her. Uh, this is our, our diver, and she came back and was the 20, 2013 SEC champion, uh, NCAA regional champion. So the, the nation, for swimming and diving, they divide the nation into four regions. So she won for a quarter of the country and had a bad national championships and finished fifth. But that was on, and she was disappointed with that. This is our baseball player. So remember, I told you, that he had just, just this focal limited area that was bad. So we cut out a focal limited area. That's my fingers holding it again. So you see we got our seven millimeter graft. This is where we used the BMAC the first time. So remember I showed you those screws? And then you couldn't see it. It looked beautiful. Well, he, I, we tell these people zero impact for one year. So no running, no cutting, no jumping. You got to let this thing incorporate. So he comes to me. It's January. So he's about, we did it in April, so I guess that's about eight months out, something like that, uh, April or May. And he goes, Doc, I think I could start on the team as a true freshman. And I said, how are you going to start in baseball when you can't run? He said, I started running last month. I said, you're an idiot. <laughs> so I talked to his parents, and they said, didn't you do that new thing where you did that bone marrow stuff, and didn't you say it looks unbelievably incorporated? I said, yeah, but we have no idea how that changes the timeline. Or if it, I said, the first thing you'll know when it fails, if he's doing it, is It'll fail. It'll be done. And they said, you know, this is his dream, and, and if you think there's any chance, then we, we want to take that risk. And I said, okay. Well, this was him in February that year. Let's see if it's supposed to just play. Hopefully it's going to... Oops, sorry. Let's see if I can get it to... Not sure why it didn't start, but there we go. See if you can figure out which leg it is. So he's about nine months out at that point. And he did start as a true freshman. He's now almost four years out. He, he uh, has, has just uh, finished his senior year of college baseball. That was two-year post-op on him. And again, we've got two more years since then. And, and, and maybe he got away with it because that was a relatively small graph for us. I don't know. Or maybe because he was 19 and the young, young can heal much quicker. This was in one of the uh, most touching emails I've ever received. I, pull, I often pull call on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, and, and so I was taking a call, and I opened my emails. And I get an email from Camp Eggers, Kabul, Afghanistan. And Major Burris had sent me this email and said, on this Thanksgiving Day, I'm thankful for you, for all you did. And then he said uh, that his knee feels better than it's felt in 10 years. I've been working on recovery. I'm now squatting 350 pounds. I did not like that. <laughs> um, doing single leg extensions with no pain and all around enjoying no pain. And I was like, wow. So these, this was the first set of advertisement type things. And all of our advertisements have been our own patients who uh, are paid nothing. And this is him. And, uh, and he, to this day, is still doing well. He's, he's one from before the center. He's about eight or nine years out now. Um, this is our 15-year-old gymnast, three years post-op at this point. Actually, three and a half now. Uh, back to full activity, 
went to competitive cheer because she was an old lady for gymnastics by this point at like 17, uh, pain free, and now is a college cheerleader at a university. And this gives you a little idea, and I'll show you her commercial in a minute. But she was back to where that knee was working. She could barely walk. As a matter of fact, the email I got from her mother in the subject line said, please, can you help my daughter? I was like, wow, what's the, I got to read this one. And, and she was barely walking at that time. And that's the competitive cheer thing. And that's what she made from all her different cheer things. And then she had the Mizzou Biojoint Center right in the middle of her quilt that she made. Um, so anyway, so this is now going to be, I'm going to show you these, um, these new advertisements. It'll give you an idea how patients do. And then the whole concept, is advertising good or bad in medicine? I don't know. I have mixed feelings. It does get patients to come, but it also brings heat. So this is Kirsten. So this is our gymnast. Oh, I, I, I don't know if we're hooked up to audio, are we? Hang on. Shoot. Do you have the audio go? I didn't. I didn't. I didn't warn you on this one. Sorry. Audio is up here, so it must be on the computer. I see. Okay, that's off. There, it's on. Oh. Okay. So in theory, it should be working now. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's showing. It. Okay, yeah, let me let me run it then and see. Okay. Hmm. I know it works if I just run it from the computer. So. Yeah, it's giving us. A no, that's that's showing me it, it is running. Well, you can watch and see what she's able to do. You can't hear what she's saying, but sorry, I'm not sure why it's not going. But so you can see the function level she hits, and then uh, next one. This was a soldier who's back in the 82nd Airborne. So this one struck close to home because I I was uh, in the 82nd Airborne for a while. And, when you jump and land, you land pretty hard. And, and he just notes in here that he got his first injury on a helicopter jump in Afghanistan and that he was at the point now after the surgeries had failed and, and hadn't resolved things where he was going to be boarded out of the military on a medical discharge, which he didn't want. That's a static line for a jump, that yellow thing. And uh, now he's back and, and going full bore because he got the uh, cartilage transplant. And then they show him going out for a helicopter jump. And then the last one, in some ways, is my favorite. Um, this is so you got you got this incredible gymnast, you got this soldier that jumps out of airplanes. Well, that's not most of us, right? And then you got this guy, and he notes that his first surgery occurred when he was 11 years old, and he just liked to play basketball and lace them up and whatnot. And so he's saying, you know, I, I and he listed three or four different knees. Every one of our people have had multiple surgeries before we do this, and he's putting them on and say, I didn't know if I'd ever be able to lace them up again. They show these guys jamming and, and, and slamming the ball and really great basketball players. And you're wondering, is that what he's going to be? And then he goes, uh, and then I had surgery and, and, and was able to, to return back. And there he goes. And then his daughter hits him in the chest with a pass and says, come on, Dad. And, and he just goes, and all he's trying to do is play with his family. And so in some ways, maybe that's the most effective, because that's really what, what the rest of us are, right? A, a couple of. Uh, to, to finish up real quick, a couple of really extreme cases. So this is a 57-year-old that was uh, an extremely active, did, did marathons, did all kinds of things, then had a really bad tibial plateau fracture. And she had this terrible situation. A good friend of mine at the University of California, Davis, who's a really good orthopedic surgeon, said, Jim, there was no carters left, and this has just destroyed her, and she really doesn't want a total joint. Because she's an age where a total joint's a very reasonable thing. And so I, I talked to her, and I said, do you realize that... that this amount, I don't know if we can make this work and that there's high risks. You can see she's in terrible malalignment. That line should be going through the middle of her knee. And then if you look at what she looks like when she walks, it's bottom line not. It's painful just to even watch her. You know, you can see that leg sticking out and she's got, and, and it's just, it's not good. And so she said, I understand, I understand the risk. 
she had to actually pay up front and then sue the insurance company and successfully um, in order to get it covered. So this is when we did her surgery. Really bad on the femur, really bad on the tibial plateau, and, and I think she had some patellofemoral too. You can see the, how big the area is. We didn't do the entire condyle, but most of it. Uh, it, it had really been beaten up. We had to put some graft behind it as well. This is us putting in those, those uh, smart nails, those bioabsorbable pins. Uh, and here's where we're cutting out the tibial plateau. There's what we cut out of her tibial plateau versus what we're putting in. Uh, they're sliding that plateau in. She needed a, an osteotomy, and she actually ended up needing one on the tibia as well. So there's the graphs. Here's her one year. It was actually almost 15 months follow-up. And then this is what she looks like walking now. And she's actually just started uh, running again. So other than maybe needing to get a little strength back and getting her full symmetry back, she's actually really doing pretty well. And here's one that's even a little bit more extreme. This guy is 25 or 6 when we did this, at about age 21. He was a, a test car person for, for a, uh, one of the manufacturers and was out, and he get, basically got his tibial plateau crushed between two bumpers. He'd had more than 20 operations. Oops, that's... This is supposed to be animated, sorry. Um, you can't really see... It's not worth coming out. Well... Let me, let me stop the show for a second to try and let you see this one. Well, he'd been on crutches for four years. I'll go ahead and let you see that. You can't see his damage, unfortunately, because I, I, I had this thing animated, but it's not, not working right now. But you can see him. This is the first time he'd walked in four years, and, and he's walking on it really well. And he had just a terribly badly damaged tibial plateau. I'm not sure why it's skipping over. Oh, well. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's what his looked like. So what I would tell you in kind of summary is when it works, it really works, and they achieve a really high level of function. Back to military combat, back to baseball, running 5 and 10K races, including that was a 56 or 7 year old who'd done four uh, 5 to 10K races over the last five months with her daughter. She's two years out. Um, competitive cheering gymnastics, mountain climbing, all kinds of things. But when it does not work, they may be a little worse than when we started because there are areas where there's some cartilage that is partial thickness that we're now cutting out and putting in, totally normal cartilage. So if it fails, that's going to fail too. So I find you've got to really coach and counsel these people very carefully that pain is not an indicator that they're healed. They have to give it time to heal in. Is it a replacement for total knee? Absolutely not. It's a different patient. They're younger and they're more active, number one. Number two, we have a limited supply of grafts. And number three, it's too expensive. So we can't do this for everybody that has missing articular cartilage. It's got to be chosen for the right type of patient. But a tough question we're going to have to wrestle with is, well, what about when we age? So I love this picture. You got this guy. I don't know, he's 70, 68, whatever. And you can see he is not going to let her pass him. <laughs> and he's, he's going down before he lets her pass him. Well, what, what do you do for this guy? Because he'll, he'll be miserable with a total knee because he'll have to really change what he's wanting to do and what he really seems to care about. But he's older. So do you spend that money? Do you do it? What's the pros? What's the cons? I don't know that we have the answer. And then what should the future be, or what can it be? So this is from our labs, and this is taking an agarose gel, seeding it with cells, some TGF beta, and then dynamic loading, some microspheres with dexamethasone, and you can start to get something that looks a lot like cartilage. And it actually even anneals to the bone. And this is a, a study where it's been done with uh, different animals. This is a humeral head, so you can image the humeral head, and then grow the humeral head, and this is a rabbit study that was done, and they're back hopping around pretty well on it. And this is, again, what it looks like. It doesn't look like cartilage there, but then when you put it in that bioreactor and take it running, it goes from that to that to that, and you start to get something that's starting to look like a patella, and then it really looks like a patella. That's an engineered patella and an engineered trochlea, and this is, again, in canines, both in research animals and showing that it's alive, and that's what it looked like. But then this is one of Jimmy Cook's patients. That's not a study animal, 
and that's with an engineered joint. So could this be a future? Maybe. Maybe. But there's zero FDA approval for anything like that. And we think you're looking at a probably 10 or more year timeline and probably at least $100 million, maybe more, to try and get through the FDA with something like that. So will we get there? Will this maybe become available for a broader number of people? Even if it does, I would argue that total knee is still the correct answer for somebody who's less active because this takes time to heal in unless one of you can figure out how to make the bone heal in more rapidly and more reliably because that's the part that we still, that creeping substitution, that's the make or break. So take home principles, go big or go home. So take out all of the damaged cartilage. I didn't show you a picture, but I did one where I left some of that grade two changes that weren't full thickness. And it's, it worked for five or six years for the patient, but then they had a total knee. It's an older person. And what had, had uh, the grafts that I put in looked like the day I put them in, they were beautiful. They failed the areas that we hadn't replaced that were partial damage. So if you're going to do it, you probably need to replace all of the damaged cartilage. Live cells definitely make a difference. You've got to have live cells. Activity level of the patient matters. This is not for a sedentary patient, and, and, and the sedentary patient should have a normal total knee, and a really active patient, be careful about doing that total knee unless they're willing to change their activity. Cut the grafts thin. It's really important. Replace large surfaces with a single graft. Don't do the snowman. And then when it works again, it really restores knee to excellent function. But when it fails, they're probably worse off. So there, I'll finish. If there's any questions, happy to uh, entertain them. That's our, our, our walk through the world of articular cartilage from, uh, from bench to bedside uh, at the University of Missouri. And thank you all for having me. Yes. You had a patient who had had a total knee replacement in the past, but either became active or was active. Would it be feasible or possible to replace any of the implanted material and use these mops, uh, these mops tissues to replace that original uh, implant? Currently, the the cuts normally made for total knees are thicker than that six to seven millimeter. And that, that's the, the, the one limiter is that. And so on a single patient who was military, that the military asked us what we considered was 35 that had bilateral total knees done, both of which were now painful total knees. Um, and he was otherwise looking at revisions. And we said, look, we don't think it, it, it's too, too thick. We don't think it can work. And, and they said, he and his command and everybody said, we'd like you to try if you think there's any chance. We said, we doubt it, but we'll try. So we did it on both sides, had to chip out some cement and all that business. And uh, they looked good, and then the knucklehead started doing rucksack marches at four months and things. So we'll never know if it might have worked because he made it fail. Just It would have failed if they were seven millimeters because he did stupid activities and caused it to fail. But, but right now I'd say we need something that will stimulate the bone healing and that creeping substitution more. That's the limiter. It's just that thickness, and they run out of gas before they get too far. And so if we could, could successfully um, make that go further faster, then it would be possible. But, but if not, it's a little like a house without a foundation and it collapses. We tell people if you've gone total joint, um, you're down that pathway. You can't, can't go back. That's what we tell them. Yes? What's, uh, what's in the box that makes it work so well? So I, it, it is a proprietary formula that I do not know. Um, I will tell you it's all normal. It, nothing that required FDA approval because of the ingredient. Uh, I know there's some antibiotic in it because we've had a grand total out of these. I've done about 300. I've had a single infection, which some of these surgeries are really long, and you would expect a higher rate than that. So, um, but, but I don't know what all it is, except I know it's nothing fancy. It's just a mix that seemed to work well. I do think the room temperature is a big part of it, too, a really big part. Yes? So we have like that 57-year-old I showed you, the, where she dug that deep hole. She had some area that was as deep as 13 or 14 millimeters. And the Polish girl, same thing. But it wasn't the whole area. It was kind of an area they got in a hole. So I used something called the Reamer Irrigator Aspirator, which harvests 
a bone slurry that's full of proteins and VEGF and BMP and all those good things and some cells. And I, and I filled in a little bit. We also went slower in their re rehab. We held them a little longer on weight bearing and went a little slower. We didn't get them on a bike till about six months, didn't get them on an elliptical till nine. Normally we'll go four and six months respectively for those two. And we did manage, and same thing with that, the, guy, the guy who hadn't walked in four years. We went, he had some thick areas. We went really slow with him because I didn't, I didn't take a picture of his skin, but he'd had major flap work done. He had a terrible soft tissue envelope. So um, you can, but I, I think all of those patients that are abnormal, they're not part of that database. Those were only normals where we could cut a normal graft. Now they worked. I'd love to have had them in after the fact because they worked, but you can't, it doesn't work that way. It's either, they're either in it at the beginning or they're not in it. Um, so I think you can probably push the envelope some uh, and, and doing some things like the, the BMP. And again, what I think our limiter is if somebody can make a better breakthrough on the bone, um, then I think we could, we could go further. Yes? So one that worries me, it's a tough group, is you'll get kids and they're, they're, they're in their early teens usually that have uh, osteonecrosis for reasons we don't know in most cases. And sometimes that area of osteonecrosis goes deeper. It almost always does, and I've had to graph some of that, and I'll use the rear bone there as well. Um, so that's a consideration, but again, in a 14-year-old, um, what else are you going to do? And so we'll just go slower. And again, in more focal areas, if it's not the entire, if I'm not cutting the whole graph that thick, but I'm cutting the graft my, my normal and then I'm packing behind. But I worry because they have a blood supply issue. And some of the failures is it just they have an area their blood just it, it's not an adequate supply. And I don't have a good way to test that right now. Um, so that could be some of the failures. They're, they're just, they can't do it. Their body can't do it. Um, and, and we don't have a great way to, te to test that right now. Um, but anyway. Yes. Yeah, that was uh, phenomenal. Um, oh, thank you. Absolutely, yeah. Life-changing, so, areas. Yeah, great question. I, I should have I gone to that. Um, yes. So we've done probably about 15 hips and maybe 20 ankles. The hip is by far the biggest challenge. You've got both the biomechanical issue and then the blood supply. Acetabulum heals like a charm. It's easy because you've got a great blood supply there. The femoral neck head is the problem. If you're doing a circular graft out of the femoral neck and head, that'll work great. If you're doing the whole thing, it's a much bigger challenge to get to work. The ankle, in my mind, is the lowest hanging fruit from pylons and things that have gone badly. And, and total ankles are still a work in progress. Um, and, and we've done 20 or so of those. And they, they've gotten to where those are working pretty well. Um, the biggest problem there is insurance approval. So the knee, reason we've done 300 knees and 20 ankles is basically getting insurance approvals is that much harder because it falls totally under the experimental line. We also have done a little bit in the shoulder, uh, including some rotator cuffs and that, are, that are live for massive defects, but where you f feel like it's a patient that needs something. Um, and then clearly glenoid and humeral head. Um, the, the other one that, uh, uh, that we're now getting ready to get going on that I think has some really potential hope is radial head. So the spacers in the young patients are, are now not looking so good as we're getting longer follow-up. And, and I think maybe, but we got to prove it with the blood supply there that you could do the whole head really thin and then and then car carve the bone and fix it maybe just with screws uh, and and maybe get that to work. But the, we're going to uh, try and Sean O'Driscoll and, and uh, uh, Greg Della Rock at our place are going to try and get that. Sean's at and Mayo and Greg is a good, a good friend of his that's at our place. Going to try and look at that. And I think there's other there's some hand potential opportunities. I think any place that that you you have cartilage there's potential use. And the other one I didn't mention, but with this fluid, I think at a busy center, you could have small ones. Right now, if, if, a, if they look at a, at, at a cadaver, it's, a, it's a weird industry. They, they buy it sight unseen, essentially. So they can't look in the knee and say, yeah, we'll buy that one. They, they say, okay, we want this patient that's offered as a donor. And, and there's money being paid even though they're a donor. And I don't, I don't understand how it works. But, but it, anyway, once they get in there, if there's a single ding in the cartilage, okay, we're not harvesting that one. You could cut out multiple 10 and 15 millimeter circular specimens from pristine cartilage 
And I think that with the ability to keep them at least 56 days, and those you could probably keep safely for 70 or more because, again, it's a much smaller area, you could have that on a shelf so when you encounter one or if you're doing a trauma and you're missing some, just grab it off the shelf. If it, it expires, throw it away, no, no harm, no foul, because that was one that was going to be thrown away anyway, so your only cost is the processing. That's what I'd like to see them do, and I think that may happen. Um, uh, one of the non-MOPS banks has done that, but I'm really hesitant to use a longer one from them. Uh, so uh, that might open up some opportunities for us as far as uh, on the fly without knowing ahead of time also. So, yes? E e sure. I'm all ears if anybody. So we, we've played with, and I'm trying to remember, our trauma fellow did, uh, he'd come from Canada, he'd done something, I don't even recall what it was, and tried, and it was so-so. But, but we're, we, are, we are looking into anything, and we're, we're open to anything. And we, we've definitely used a little bit in some extreme cases, but there's a cost, and you've got to get approval, things like bone growth stimulators, and they do seem to help. We absolutely make sure everyone's on vitamin D and calcium. Um, all of that kind of stuff for sure. Um, but there's no question if somebody could come up with something else that will turn that process on a little better, you could go thicker and you could ha decrease. Our, our failure rate for those who stick with the protocol right now is below 10% on the MOPS graphs, if you'll stick with the protocol. And that's the number one cause of failure is not staying with the protocol. It's a seven-fold increase. Uh, it's a higher risk than if you're too heavy or if you're having multiple surfaces or anything else. And so... Uh, that, that just got accepted for publication and should be coming out soon. And that one is helping me get patients to understand this is like a Tommy John operation in a baseball pitcher. If you don't give it 13 months, you'll ruin that. And if you don't give this 12, you'll ruin it. Because patients, I, didn't, I, didn't, I warned them all not to do it, but I didn't realize how strong the draw would be that if they're pain-free after years not being pain-free, they're assuming that they healed faster and that they can go ahead and do it even though I said otherwise. And now I, I, I warn them, the fact you're pain-free means nothing. You'll ruin this if you, and so people are sticking to it better, and so I think our numbers are going to get better and better. And if we can get reliably below 10%, now we're getting into a, a good range. But it's a kick in the gut when they fail because it doesn't fail right away. It fails 9 to 12 months later after they've felt life with no pain for a while. And, and they, it's devastating to them. It sucks for you as the doc. I mean, it, it just, uh, it, it's definitely a, just, just a, a bad day. Um, before we started getting control of some of this and before I knew not to use other graphs, I was like, I don't want to go to clinic because uh, I, I didn't want to hit somebody else who you've become, gotten to know, become friends with, and you get to tell them, you know that thing you were banking everything on? Yeah, it didn't work. Um, so it's getting there, but that's, that's kind of the painful side. If any of you think up a great thing for the creeping substitution, let's talk because uh, it, it definitely, uh, it's the limiter right now in my mind. Yes, so, so we uh, initially, I warned them, but I didn't, I didn't eliminate them. Now I will not do a smoker. Uh, you're going to have to prove to me that you've given. Now I can't stop. had one knucklehead who had quit the smoking, proved it with a P test, and was smoking the night of surgery out in the, and it's like, okay, you get what you get. Um, and, and they filed a lawsuit over their failure. Uh, just the, the, the pleasant part of our, our business. Um, but but uh, that, that is what it is. There's a BMI cutoff of 35, but we also have a program to help them drop the weight. So we don't just say, come back. We say, we've got this program, if you give it a shot. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, if you're on opioids, we will not do it. You have to get off of them first. Um, I think that's our big. The other one I'll look at, so if you're, if you're a, a, a landscaper, and you don't have a plan for how you can supervise while other people pick up the bushes and things like that, if you can't make me convinced that you have the possibility of giving it that year to heal in, then I won't do you. I got one vet, vet really angry at me because she was right at the border weight-wise. She was old, and, and older also. So we've done some older, but, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a soft contraindication. Over age 55, many insurances won't pay. She was borderline age, borderline weight, and was a vet and made it clear that she was going to be right back at her practice and that she stands all day and that she squats all the time and this and that. And I, I said, you know, I think you got too many factors going at you. And boy, was she unhappy. 
but I think she was a failure waiting to happen. So I've gotten a little smarter as we've gotten further along in this, that not doing anybody a favor doing it and then having them fail. So hate being judgmental on that, but at the same time, uh, you know, I think you have to. So I'd be happy. I know, I know we have to cut off. I'd be happy to speak with anybody afterwards uh, and answer any other questions.